Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everybody. Um, I am Dan Davies. I'm the president of the Army Saskatchewan chapter. I'd like to welcome you all this morning uh, and say a happy new year to you all. Let me welcome you to um, our fourth session in our uh, program series. Today's topic is Privacy 101. Our fearless presenter today is uh, once again Rick Sterling from President of Western IM. And uh, I'm going to let him take off from here. Thanks, Rick. Uh, thanks, Dan. Welcome, everybody. And uh, thanks for joining us in the Privacy 101 for Information Management Professionals webinar today. As Dan said, my name is Rick Sterling, and I'm the president of Western IM in Saskatoon. I'm also on the board of directors of ARMA Saskatchewan as a director at large, and I'm currently serving as the chair of the ARMA International Information Governance Professional Certification Board on, the, on a more international level. The Western IM team has specialized in all facets of enterprise information management and information governance across Canada for over 20 years. The Armour Saskatchewan Board has elected to use a webinar-based delivery mechanism for the program content today and in the future as well, in the hope that uh, many more may be able to attend the Armour Saskatchewan program offerings, since it removes the need to travel. And we all know we have to save money these days on travel. Please invite your colleagues from different professional disciplines in your organization to attend this series as well. Uh, this should create discussion opportunities about corporate information management, governance, and strategic alignment of all professional resources. So I just wanted to say a little bit about the uh, uh, ARMA IGP, Information Governance Professional Certification Program, since it ties in with this presentation as well as the rest of this series. The ARMA IGP certification was created to facilitate an overarching corporate uh, discipline which could have the breadth of understanding to unify all the strategic corporate information areas. This of course requires an understanding of risk, security, IT, legal, privacy, and records and information management, as well as all complementary uh, corporate, the other complementary corporate disciplines. With the digital transformation either occurring, or at least soon to occur in most organizations, along with an exponential technology change, coupled with the ongoing series of negative security events happening around the world, it is a really good time for all major corporate disciplines to come together in a more structured and consistent way in order to assist their company in meeting their corporate goals, which is always, in the end, the thing that needs to be done. Arma Saskatchewan is providing this sequence of presentations to facilitate a deeper understanding for strategic professionals of some of the major information management disciplines, as well as members of senior management who are interested in the positive impact that information governance could have on their organizations. This, president's, uh, this uh, sorry, pres presentation sequence uh, continues today with Privacy 101 which will set the stage for a following in-depth uh, privacy presentation at a later time, hopefully this month sometime later on. Uh, at the conclusion of this series, there will be an information governance event, and the presentations will all be recorded so that they may be viewed at, at a later date. You can use the recordings to foster internal discussion on the topic by hosting events such as maybe a lunch and learn or other types of things in your corporation. We hope you will be able to attend this full series of important and thought-provoking presentations. So Denise, let's do the first poll of two in today's session, please. Okay. Has your organization done a PIA, Privacy Impact Assessment? The poll is open. And again, as always, I can't really see the poll. So I'm going to let Denise share the results of the poll uh, with me when we get the results. OK. This is like being Vanna, uh, Denise. Kind of, yeah. You, know, you get to reveal the, the results. <laughs> 
Okay, our poll is complete and in answer to the question, has your organization ever done a privacy impact assessment? 50% say yes, possibly many times. 8% say no, should we? And 42% say not sure, don't know. Really good. Interesting uh, to me are, are those that, um, we will talk a little bit about PIAs uh, later on in the presentation. So for those of you that are not sure uh, that you might want to perform one, um, we, we will maybe speak to that a little bit during that slide. And for those of you that have, you're old hands at this now, I think, seasoned veterans, probably. And uh, just one thing before we really get into the presentation, hopefully the privacy people don't go to sleep during this presentation because they know a lot of this stuff already. So here we go. So what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about certification which we have in all of our presentations so far. We are going to uh, talk about um, so that as we uh, as as in our privacy 101 uh, session uh, today, large extent I kept the same format as the previous 101 sessions which had certification and things like that in them. But privacy is a little bit different than the previous three topics that we've talked about, in my, in my opinion. Privacy kind of reminds me a lot of, of records and information management in that there's not a lot of training available for the discipline. Not to say that each province and territory in Canada, as well as the federal government, have not created uh, training courses to start someone off on a privacy on the privacy road um, but many of these training sessions and training courses available are a day in length which kind of leaves the attendees new to privacy with just enough knowledge to kind of be dangerous I know what that feels like when I started records management 20 years ago all of my longtime records management friends would tell me the story of how they got into the records management business and most of these stories were very very similar I really like uh, Cheryl Pedersen's story the best. Cheryl, uh, if you don't know Cheryl, she is now retired, but she was a past president of Arm International, a board member, uh, international board member, and international treasurer of Arma. And in her corporate life, she was the information manager for Cargill, which will be very familiar to anyone here on the prairies in Canada, since there are grain elevators along the major routes that, uh, with, with that name on them. Cargill is actually the largest privately held company in the world with 150,000 employees and operations in well over 100 countries. So Cheryl started her career as a legal secretary in the legal department of Cargill's head office in Minneapolis. And one day, one of the senior executives said to her, Cheryl, you know how to file things. How would you feel about taking on records management? And so it began for many of my longtime friends in ARMA, privacy seems to me to be a lot like that in that training and certification is not available everywhere. And often someone is just chosen as a privacy officer in an organization because of one reason or another. It also seems to me that privacy people I know had to do a lot of their learning in pieces, kind of on their own, by asking a lot of questions of their colleagues and also uh, that also did privacy. So it seems a lot uh, the same to me as the uh, records and information management discipline. In this 101 presentation, we'll be looking at certification and, and going a little uh, into a little background of how privacy um, shaped up and began in Canada, uh, the European Union, United States, and, uh, and we're going to talk about what's happening uh, right now in the EU, which is pretty, I think, very important to uh, the future of privacy in the world. So the resources I use for the presentation, and, and there's there's a lot of resources around for um, related to privacy uh, from different places all over the the uh, uh, North America and, and Europe. For those of you that don't know uh, where things came from and how they were created, uh, the first book on the list is uh, uh, "Protecting Privacy in the Surveillance Society." It, it's a uh, it's a very it's an old book. Uh, it's not a current book. Uh, but it goes into great detail about how privacy started, not just in Canada, but in several other jurisdictions. So it's a really good kind of historical 
uh, reference to the privacy uh, profession and how it got going. We'll be talking a bit more about uh, GDPR, that this uh, general data protection regulation, uh, and the EU later, much later in the presentation. But you can see already that I consider it fairly important to the uh, primary dis uh, the privacy discussion, since there are several books on the list. The GDPR document itself can be found at the web location on the slide. It's uh, 88 pages long, though, so it might take a while to read it if you decide you want to do that. Which, you know, for the, some of us really like reading that kind of stuff, so you, you might really enjoy the read. The next document on the list was done by one of our own, actually, uh, Stuart Rennie of BC. Stuart is a lawyer and spends a lot of his career working in the records and information management field. The uh, AIEF, that's the ARMA International Educational Foundation, is an arm's length organization to ARMA that gives grants to students as well as funds research in our field. And if you don't know um, much about the A AIEF, you should go and have a look at, at their website for sure. And you can actually go to the location in the slide here for, uh, for free and get that document that Stuart did, as well as a corresponding spreadsheet. And that's, uh, it's probably one of the best jurisdiction privacy documents I've read comparing Canadian privacy legislation in the entire country, as well as any discrepancies province to province, federally and territorially. So really, really a top quality document uh, when you get a chance to have a look at that. It's something you should pull down because it's a really good uh, thing to have around. Virginia Jones, uh, who I've known for many years, is a prolific author of records and information management books in ARMA. And if you are an ARMA person and have acquired books from the bookstore, many of them were written by, by uh, Jenny Jones. Uh, she's won many uh, awards, ARMA awards, liter literary awards in, in ARMA. On the same site as Stuart uh, Rainey's research document, you will also find uh, one by Jenny on the US uh, personal information protection space and a myriad of disparate legislation in the U.S., which was just updated in 2017. Uh, so it's uh, absolutely current at this point. And uh, also a very good read if you're interested in kind of what's happening around, around the world. We'll talk about the U.S. Uh, legislation a little bit more as we get further on in the presentation. There's information on privacy all over the internet, so if you decide to dive in a little deeper, you'll have no lack of interesting late night reading for sure. <laughs> so the IAPP, that's the International Association of Privacy Professionals. If you look at privacy from a certification position as we have for the previous three disciplines, you will find very little out there. One specific certification does come from the IAPP, which stands, uh, as I said, for the International Association of Privacy Professionals. Now they have quite a few different certifications available, but the one specific to Canada is the CIPP slash C, and that stands for Certified Information Privacy Professional, and the slash C, of course, is for Canada. The web location, if you want to take a closer look, is right here on the slide. And you can see what the pricing model looks like. It's very similar to some of the other certifications we've seen in the other presentations we've done. Privacy online training is, you know, 11.95 US is a is a fair chunk of money for that. The book itself in hard copy is only 75 dollars US, and it doesn't come in Kindle form, so you have to order the hard copy uh, book to get that. And exam writing around 5.50. The U.S., which is very similar to most of the other certification uh, things that we've seen in the other presentations and other disciplines. So I thought it would, we, we could do the you know basic privacy basics for those <clears throat> very pri basic privacy steps for those of you that, that don't work in the privacy field day by day, and all, all you privacy folks on this webinar can sleep for the next two slides. <laughs> That's a good thing. Uh, one of the first things that usually happens when an organization decides to move in a privacy direction is to assign someone as the privacy officer. So that's that's a you know kind of must-have thing. I've seen several organizations that have actually added that privacy officer hat to the records manager, 
of the organization and others that have appointed a separate individual to deal with that issue. In the larger organization, uh, more of a separate role usually. I'm sure that uh, most of these on this slide seem like pretty straightforward things, these, these points, privacy basic, basics, but in fact they can take a lot of time. Just developing a policy, for instance, in itself can be quite a substantial task. And for sure, doing inventory of any legacy information in the organization to look for the existence of potential privacy risks can be a time-consuming effort. Very advantageous to have a process in place to deal with requests of in for information. And once that process is in place, all departments and business units should be informed of its existence and, tra and trained on, on that. Requiring third-party contractors to deal with any PII, that's uh, acronym, of course, for personally identifiable information of yours. Uh, they might have needs uh, that they might have uh, and need to use. It, a very well thought out contractual ob obligation needs to be done. If you don't put it in the contract and then possibly audit them to make sure they're doing it properly, it's not really complete. So that's it's kind of that linkage um, between uh, uh, privacy and, and outside folks that need to deal with your information. Also related to the cloud, uh, the thoughts of corporate information going into someone else's repository without proper contractual obligation and audit really scares me uh, quite a bit. We spent quite a bit of time talking about the cloud and possible issues and situations in the first few presentations. So if you didn't get, get a chance to listen to them uh, and you're interested in the cloud, uh, you can go to the location where they were they were stored and and kind of view the other presentations because there's a lot of uh, discussion about cloud in the other uh, uh, the other sessions we've had up till now the one-on-one -on -one sessions. So just a continuation of the basic privacy uh, points. Just a you know, don't collect the information if you don't need it. Rule of of thumb. Make sure your website has privacy policy on it. Always state the purpose for collection of information and assure yourself that there is an opt-in checkbox that is unchecked when an individual gets it. This point has the possibility of becoming one of the singularly, singularly most important things on the privacy side related to the electronic collection of personal information. And we'll speak more about that when we get to the GDPR slides. Make, for now, making sure that anyone giving you information is carefully informed and able to opt in is the perfect choice. Of course, making sure that the information is, that is no longer required is deleted is always very important. This is my, uh, this in my opinion is becoming a, a, a much bigger issue all the time. Many corporations that I talk to are considering or have already started to use current information for business intelligence purposes, or BI for short. There's more and more talk about data warehouses, data lakes, big data, all the time at senior management level. I'm not convinced that, that most of this is without, I'm, I'm quite convinced I should say that most of this is without any deep consideration of privacy at all. So I guess the point is make sure that you get into and with your uh, senior, make sure you're at the table in those senior management discussions about BI, uh, about big data, and uh, analyzation of analyzing the data in the organization. Last point is allowing access and update capability for those individuals that have given you personal information for some reason or another. Again, we'll, we'll see that a little bit more when we get to, to the GDPR topic uh, later in the presentation. So different phases of privacy. Uh, I wanted to do a reset on privacy and the related topics of discussion. So far, I've uh, mainly talked about privacy as it relates to personal information. And as you can see on this slide related to privacy, we also want to think about freedom of information requests, which uh, you have to find you have to find it all first before you decide you might give it up and maybe do redaction on personal information prior to that. And I know a lot of you are deeply into that uh, freedom of information request side of, of the house. 
Um, I can recall a time, oh, many years ago when I first started in records and information management uh, space and uh, having many discussions with my colleagues and friends who had been in it for years and years about freedom of information, which was reasonably new at that time. And uh, having them say to me, oh, no big deal. It's, we're not going to get much of this. It won't be a big deal. And me saying to them uh, at that time, I think you're wrong. I think there's going to be a lot of this. And I think it's going to cost a lot of money. And it's going to get worse and worse all the time, or better and better, which, whichever side of that fence you happen to be on. I think uh, it proves out, too, in most of my uh, clients across the country that the freedom of information requests have gone up dramatically. And the complexity of those requests uh, have also gone up dramatically. So uh, it's a big deal. Discrepancies between paper and electronic information as it relates to processes, like uh, it's certainly different looking for electronic information than it is for trying to find the paper information that, uh, that, that may exist on a particular request. And we have uh, uh, infrastructures now that are widely uh, electronic and we have quite a jumble of information in our uh, shared drives and things like that. So it, it presents a bit of an issue, I think, for a lot of people to do that rich request search to try and find all the information. I always said for years that the, uh, the, the, the freedom of information people in the organization are the ones with the tiny beads of sweat on their forehead because they have to sign off saying they found everything when in fact they kind of know there, there may be an opportunity that some things miss, were missed in that, that search. So uh, we also need to talk about and think about the anonymization of data sets that we, uh, we may own as well as the possibility of the right to be forgotten topic. So data anonymization um, really is, a, is kind of a big topic of discussion around the country right now because a lot of people are taking data sets that they own and, and trying to uh, give them out to uh, the, the public more or less so people can write apps around them for uh, personal phones and things like that. Uh, for instance, a, a bus schedule uh, might be given out to uh, developers so that they can write apps so people can find where the buses are that they need to get and things like that so that the municipalities don't have to do that. That kind of thing. And that's kind of happening in a lot of places now. But of course, we need to make sure that any information in there uh, is, is not uh, personal information when we give out a data set. So the uh, right to be forgotten topic uh, coming into play down the road, I know that several of my clients are already trying to deal with right to be forgotten, even though uh, there's no legislation uh, specifically in Canada that requires this. Uh, the difficulties and the costs involved in trying to find all the information you may own about a particular individual is quite onerous. Uh, so far, those of you that are not used to that term. So uh, picture yourself as a consumer walking into some provider that you deal with and saying, I want you to get rid of all my information that you have about me. Uh, not as easy, easily done as, as, as we say, and fairly costly to try and do that kind of thing for, um, for the right reasons. So uh, the, just a, a very quick hit on privacy impact assessment. Um, I thought I'd put up one slide really and, and uh, and just speak to it a little bit. And here's my good friend, uh, the Wikipedia definition, <laughs> uh, not always perfect, but actually seems to cover the thought reasonably well. So for those of, of you that have never done a privacy impact assessment, uh, they're, they're, often, they're often done when some major new corporate process is occurring. Uh, policy is either under, undergoing a radical change or it's being created for the first time or a major new project is about to start up, which may relate uh, to personal information and privacy. So uh, if there's, if any of those things relate to uh, or have the possibility to have personal information in them, a, a privacy impact assessment is a good thing to do just to make sure that there's nothing left to the imagination with uh, those major kind of things going on. So, uh, I don't want to go a lot farther with privacy impact assessments. There's a, there's a lot of information on the internet up to and including checklists and documentation for the creation of 
of PIA. So if you want to know more about that, you can certainly go in and and uh, and, and look for some of those things. If you want to, uh, you'll probably get a little more inf uh, detailed information about that from our expert when we when we do our 102 presentation on privacy. But uh, for the 101, that's that's where I'm going to stop for now. So we're going to talk first about Canadian legislation because we're in Canada. So it's time to kind of take a look at, at the Canadian landscape. So uh, as many of you know, there was quite a, a lead up to uh, um, the Personal Inform Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act. I call it PIPTA. Some people call it TIPTA. Some people call it uh, other pronounce it other ways, but it's the Personal Information Protection Electronic Documents Act, which I think was the, really the biggest thing in privacy in Canada, uh, which we'll, we'll get into in the, in the next slide. And there are three acts really that led up to that piece of legislation. So I, I remember, uh, I'll share you this story with you, I remember doing a presentation early in my ARMA career when I was region manager for Canada uh, in Ottawa and uh, centered around voicemail and whether it was a record. And at that time, there was a large discussion about wiretap. And I found it interesting to know that there's no law against taping a conversation with someone on the phone. So if you've ever done a, a conversation with a news person, like an interview over the phone, and you might have heard a small beep on the line, that is actually the news person informing you that they're taping the conversation. So don't ever get trapped on, a, on an interview on the phone uh, with a news a news person because that and and wait for the beep on the line. Conversation only becomes a wiretap if you leave a recording running and walk away from a phone while others are still talking without the knowledge that the recording is running. So that kind of separates it out from just recording on a call to being a wiretap at that time. Also interesting to me to note that it was 1977 when the when the Privacy Commissioner post was was first created in Canada. That was a long time ago now. Seems to me that was a long time ago. So we've been kind of at this for quite a long time in an evolutionary kind of way. When I started in the records and information management space in the mid-90s, the federal government was still wrestling with access to information or ATI and personal information banks. So that they've, they've come a long way since that kind of time frame, that mid 90s. Sorry about that. So there's a, uh, I have too many phones around me in my office here. So here's the biggie, the PETA. This is what the uh, what the gave us the ability to be blessed by the European Union, and that's kind of what we have to be uh, as as Canada. We want to be blessed by the European Union and our legislation, privacy legislation. It gave us like legislation. So we all know that nobody likes to be uh, reinvent the wheel. So in 1996, the the ten privacy principles that the OECD that's the Organization of Economic Cooperation, used were incorporated by uh, Cana the Canadian Standards Association. And this kind of paved the way to the 2000 legislation, the computer legislation, and acceptance by the EU that we had like legislation. People used to say to me, you know, in the early stages of this, where, where did this new privacy legislation come from? It came as quite a shock to them, and but it kind of all started in Sweden back in 1974. Uh, that's where those, those eight of those 10 uh, kind of principles or bullet points came from in the privacy side. Interesting that only three provinces in Canada at that time wrote their own legislation and all of this fell under their federal legislation. Uh, and of course that's changed in the meantime. They're all over the map. For instance, the Saskatchewan legislation uh, does not apply to, to private sector, where Alberta's, Alberta's does. And uh, if and when you get a chance to read Stuart Rennie's comparison document, you will find a somewhat confusing landscape from province to province and territory to territory in Canada, with, of course, Quebec uh, taking the prize for the most different version, which is quite normal in, in Quebec that they uh, 
are treated in it and treat themselves in a, a very separate way from uh, other provinces in the country. So thoughts about electronic records being equivalent to paper. So at the time Papita was written, the EDA on the end of the Electronic Documents Act, I thought was pretty groundbreaking. Really what it alluded to was paper and electronic documents were equivalent. Up to that point, I had clients tell me often that they considered their paper documents the corporate records and not the electronic. And they really excluded electronic up to that point. So at the moment in time, you needed to produce, once that was done, uh, even if you didn't really apply to PEPIDA under the, uh, the legislation uh, because you were, uh, your provincial legislation had no uh, bearing on you being a, a private corporation or not, but it kind of changed the landscape at that point. So you really had to start kind of producing both paper and electronic records as required and also try to make sure that both paper and electronic records were disposed of simultaneously, which we all know is, is a, tr a tricky thing sometimes. So this also brought up the issue of security. And in the day, paper records were kept mostly in central areas or behind locked office doors. And there was usually a gatekeeper, i.e. A, a records person that knew whether someone should or shouldn't be able to see a particular uh, document or record. But the uh, focus being placed on electronic records, sometimes with kind of haphazard security, uh, have changed that landscape. Actually took years after that for organizations to start caring about electronic records and not turning a blind eye to the jumble that had occurred in, in the electronic side. And as much as my friends told me their paper records were out of control, they were in a lot better shape than the electronic side in, in pretty much all cases. So I want to, now we're, we're going to go over to the EU a little bit and look at uh, privacy in the European Union, which is very much related. We're more related to the EU than we are to the US. So uh, we can see by this progression of, and I'm not going to read you what's on the screen, but there's, there's a progression of privacy legislation in Europe, uh, in the European Union, that nothing moves quickly. So it started back in the 70s, you know, and, and kind of moved forward from there. It moves steadily, right, progresses uh, over time, and it's often driven by, by the relentless move of technology. So really, I, most of this stuff is driven by technology, not necessarily by anything else. Note that there were eight original principles, as I said earlier, which evolved into the 10 current uh, principles that we have now. I added a web link on the slide in case you want to explore a really good article about that time, that kind of moment in time, 30 years after the uh, privacy guidelines, first privacy guidelines. It's uh, it's always good to know, and in, in, I think anyway, it's always good to know if you're doing something like if you're a privacy person in and in, in that's your profession. It's always nice to know the historical reference on how these things came about because it helps kind of understand things going forward as well. So uh, just wanted to reiterate that what the EU does affects the rest of the world, and particularly here in Canada, where we always strive to be in line with best practices related to privacy. Whatever the EU does, Canada is usually close behind, so that we are usually in lockstep with like legislation, and as such have the blessing of the EU going forward. So on this slide, uh, we're just really looking at uh, the EU adopted their, their data protection directive and it's 1995. So again, that was a while ago, but gave their member states three years to bring their own laws into conformity. So, uh, you know, you have to give them time to, uh, in the case of the EU, you have other uh, countries that need to take their own legislation into account and make sure that the the like legislation they either write or adopt uh, is okay with their other legislation. There's a general rule in the EU that you have to give your member countries time to write appropriate legislation and validate it before it goes into force. So the undercurrent, I think, uh, through though, is, is also gives countries like Canada and, and other countries an opportunity to catch up to the new legislation in the EU. So there's, there's a time lag 
there and uh, gives everybody a chance to kind of catch up and make sure their legislation is like in kind. I wanted to speak a little bit about privacy by design. It's, it's kind of important uh, because it was really brought about by uh, one of our own uh, Canadian privacy commissioners, uh, Anne Kavukian in uh, uh, Ontario. And Anne was the privacy commissioner of Ontario from 1997 to 2014. She is a, if you've never had a chance to meet her uh, personally, she is a wonderful, wonderful person. And as are the rest of the people in her privacy commissioner's office uh, at that time that I, I did meet. And uh, during her time in office, she and her staff developed a concept called privacy by design. Now this privacy by design concept, concept was the, Eventually adopted around the world and is mentioned now in a plethora of pub publications related to privacy. Concept is really quite elegant uh, in that it suggests that software developers and system engineers should be thinking about privacy during every stage of development and of the engineering process of any software and or systems uh, created. So if privacy by design had been incorporated into software design in the very early stages around the 1980s, it would be a very different landscape than it is today. I included this for your, your perusal, the, the, the link to the document that was created by ARMA New York as well. Uh, it, and it was a really quite a good document uh, by a, an American uh, ARMA chapter. Uh, I thought it was really good and, and, uh, and you should have a look at it if you're thinking about a design checklist for um, privacy by design. Uh, situations. Nice to know that uh, Canadians have been involved in some of these things from the very beginning. So here's the uh, seven principles of privacy by design. Uh, I don't want to say too much about this except that it makes so much more sense to try and build in privacy up front in software design and other related projects than it does to try and fix them all many years after the fact. I'm sure many of you listening to this presentation will be shaking your heads yes and know exactly what I'm talking about because of having to deal with poorly developed projects that are incredibly difficult and really expensive to fix after the fact. So one of the examples that the Privacy Commissioner's Office shared with me about privacy by design was the Ontario Lottery Organization whose casinos had been keeping photographs of those people that had uh, gambling problems and ultimately had asked to be turned away if they ever showed up at the casino, at a casino. And uh, all of their pictures were stored in binders uh, in paper form. And of course, this was totally unwieldy and didn't work very well since the folks at the front door had no real way to assess whether people coming in, in were part of the turn me away crowd or not. So a project was, was started that, that did face recognition uh, as people entered the door but no thought was given to how long the information should be kept as it recorded faces on entry. You can imagine how big that got in a pretty quick time. And with the help of the Privacy uh, by Design Group, the Privacy Commissioner's Office, the issue was resolved by deleting the information every couple of days. So instead of keeping it, which would have been a really bad idea anyway, privacy people should be shaking your heads at this point. Uh, they actually got rid of it in a couple of days. and. Not only was a simple and elegant solution, um, it made the equipment and software really work efficiently and, and created a really successful project. So it was one of those kind of win-win things for privacy by design. So again, uh, always better to be at the table when those uh, kind of project things are being done to make sure that you're, uh, you have input as a privacy person into the development of any of those, those uh, projects going forward in your own uh, corporate environment. United States. So we'll skip over to the states. It's always an interesting uh, discussion about the United States. So uh, unlike Canada, they, they don't really have an overarching privacy legislation. It means that the states all enact their own legislation, so it's really very inconsistent from state to state. Again, they probably stole from each other a little bit on the writing of the of the legislation, but still in all somewhat inconsistent. 
document I spoke of earlier that Jenny Jones did for the Army International Educational Foundation uh, is a great source of information about this topic if you choose to kind of look at this in more depth. The only really overarching legislation on privacy in the U.S. is HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. And the reality today is that all of us want government and corporations alike to protect the personal information that has been extracted from us for any purpose whatsoever. Like we're all in that boat. We, we want people and corporations to protect any information that we've given them. Uh, so this alone, coupled with the EU GDPR legislation, which we'll get to later on, uh, it, it may be reason enough for the U.S. to eventually legislate some overarching privacy legislation. I think, uh, I think that may actually be the thing that causes them to finally pull the trigger. It's been going on for a long time. Uh, I, I recall a time when I was auditing a, a presentation in the, um, at an ARM International Conference in the U.S., and it was on a, a piece of legislation down there called the, um, um, I can't recall the name of it now, but it had privacy pieces in it. Electronic Transactions Act, that was it. And uh, there was an attorney uh, there and, and another person that I knew really well. The attorney was the ARMA attorney at that time. And they were doing a, a, a presentation on this Electronic Documents Act. And I looked on the screen, and as part of this, the bullet points from the PEPIDA legislation, like a whole bunch of those bullet points were up on the screen as part of this, this act. And I said, uh, excuse me, I just asked the question, when will you be, you know, uh, putting together, when, when do you think the U.S. might uh, put a privacy legislation in place, like an overarching one? And they really were quite taken aback that I would even suggest such a thing that that, that would ever happen. But again, uh, I think in, in order for those things to happen, you need something big to take place. And I think this GDPR that we're going to see uh, later on is, is one of those big events that will make that happen. So it, just to finish off, HIPAA in the U.S., uh, really big deal and taken very seriously in the U.S. Not to say it isn't here in Canada as well, because it is. But it, it came into effect in the early 2000s. And if you recall, I said earlier that there was very little privacy certification. Well, that's not true as it relates to HIPAA, where certification opportunities abound uh, as, uh, in the States. This act highly affects insurance companies, and if you are affiliated with a U.S. company that falls under HIPAA, you may need to comply as well. So it's, it's kind of an overarching thing in, in a lot of ways with several, many different kinds of companies. Just before we leave the slide, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the U.S. HIPAA legislation, but I thought it would uh, be relevant to mention that AHIMA, that's the American Health Information Management Association, actually uses the ARMA principles. So ARMA allowed them to modify uh, the ARMA principles to take their specialty area of health into consideration. So AHIMA does use the ARMA principles in a modified form for the, the, uh, uh, for the U.S. And finally, there's Safe Harbor, uh, which was a mechanism put in place by the European Union. Now, this allowed the U.S. corporations and entities to sign on to a Safe Harbor agreement. And what they did was that they had to state that they will do things correctly as it relates to privacy, uh, transfer of, of information uh, to and from Europe. And uh, all U.S. corporations that transferred data to and from the uh, European Union had to sign on uh, to this uh, to meet the previous requirements of privacy legislation in the EU. So we'll take a little closer look at this on, on the next slide. It was a big deal. The uh, safe harbor was a pretty big deal in the U.S. So the European Union eventually realized that safe harbor legislation no longer protected citizens of the EU appropriately based on exponential growth of technology and, and probably the fact that uh, most of the U.S. corporations that signed on were not adequately going, uh, they weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing to protect the privacy of the European Union citizens along the way. So in October uh, 2015, the European Court of Justice issued a judgment and declared Safe Harbor invalid, which led uh, in July of 2016, which is fairly recent, uh, to a new process called the EU-US Privacy Shield, which replaces Safe Harbor across the board. 
So all organizations that had signed on to Safe Harbor must retroactively continue to apply the principles to data received under Safe Harbor. Even though the Privacy Shield exists now, U.S. companies are now able to sign up to the Privacy Shield with the U.S. Department of Commerce, and then uh, they have to sign up with the U.S. Department of Commerce, and then, then they're able to verify that their privacy policies comply with the data protection standards required by the new rules. So just a sign of the times that as technology and processes change, there must be a shift in the legislation that protects individuals along the way. So many U.S. corporations will likely adhere to the new GDPR legislation, which is really a superset of legislation required for that uh, EU uh, privacy shield uh, situation. So that's a little bit to give you an idea about, about the U.S. and where they sit at the moment. So now I want to just talk about uh, this new Euro European standard because I think it's really critical. Um, I must say uh, there was a lot of hoo-ha about it at the uh, uh, International Pharma Conference in uh, Orlando this year, uh, US, large U.S. corporations. And uh, uh, they're, they're taking it pretty seriously now. Unfortunately, they're so close to this thing coming into, into effect, their only reaction, if they haven't moved on it, up till now because it's been kind of available for a couple of years to 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 know what's coming uh, the legislation um, if you haven't made a move uh, as a US corporation uh, that's a big US corporation they were all lawyering up so that's kind of what's what's going on in their minds so uh, in this case when we talk about GDPR, which is the General Data Protection Regulation, this is coming into force uh, soon in 2018. But, uh, I'll get to that in a second. But it's it's really critical, I think, to uh, looking forward in the world, not just in, in Europe, but in, in the rest of the world in privacy protection. So no, no sense in talking about the old uh, legislation because the GDPR is coming in right away. So let me start by saying that I think GDPR is coming into that uh, GDPR is coming into force in May of this year, and it will begin a dramatic change in the privacy legislation around the world, including Canada. I think this has been two years in the making, and uh, well, not two years. It's been way longer than two years in the making. It's been around for two years in a legislated form, agreed on legislated form, but they had to give the uh, other countries in Europe a chance, as usual, to uh, change legislation or write like legislation to meet the GDPR. So uh, large corporations even contemplate doing business in the EU. They're, they're really are lawyering up now as we speak, probably because they took way too long to react to this new legislation. So yes, it was about time for some new legislation to come in place since the previous directive was 1995, as we saw in one of the previous slides. And you know, we'll all agree, I think, on, on that, that the world has changed dramatically since 1995, electronically. So this, this, this whole GDPR thing applies to anyone doing business in the EU or doing business with a citizen of the EU which sounds to me like everyone needs to pay attention and deal with this legislation, since any citizen of the EU could be anywhere in any country at any time. The citizen must have given consent for further use of the information they provided, and any citizens of the EU can object to the processing of their data. Those same people can ask for the data that anyone has of them, and you have to supply it at no cost in a commonly readable format. Those same people can then demand you change their data if it's wrong, and of course they have a right to be forgotten, which is what they are now calling. So to change that right to be forgotten, remember we talked about that earlier, it's now in this GDPR document, they're calling it right to erasure, uh, as opposed to right to be forgotten. It means the same thing, but. Uh, requires you to erase their information from all systems. So I guess they figured that that in the legislation that was an, an easier thing to understand. Data controller and the data processor are both liable. 
so the data controller, and that this is used in that legislation all over the place, data controller is the entity slash corporation collecting the information, and the processor is the entity or entities processing that information. So, of course, that could be the same uh, company doing both, or it could be a different one. And in fact, there could be multiple processors of the information. Interesting so far? Just think what that contractual arrangements will have to look like related to a data processor that may in turn have to have contractual arrangements with other data processors since they're all liable if anything goes awry. So continuing on, you have to keep accurate and detailed records if you have more than 250 employees. So that in itself is going to be a pretty healthy uh, investment trying to keep all the, the uh, detailed records of all of these things. There is also a thing called a data protection officer or a DTO and in some cases you will need to have one of those. And the interesting thing is they can't be punished for doing that job. So you can't fire them for doing their job and you can't blame them if they make a mistake. So they're kind of independent in that way even though they work for an organ, a, a corporation as a, a DTO. What's that old expression? The buck stops here. That's what it looks like to me. You must inform the supervisory authority, which is the kind of overarching organization uh, that relates in this GDPR, supervisory authority within 72 hours of a breach or have to defend why you didn't. So this in itself is going to prove an, an, an issue for a lot of corporations because wheels turn so slowly and they're so far flung that it could easily take longer than 72 hours for that information to be processed internally. So I guess we, you know, they, all of us kind of need a, a corporate process and of course training to deal with breaches so we don't fall down in our duties. But we have uh, terrifying large corporations as this legislation rolls in very, very soon, is that there are two levels of fines based on how severe the infractions were. Now the first is 10 million euros or 2% of global revenue. And the second is even is the more severe one, 20 million or 4% of global revenue, whichever is larger. And it applies to all of your companies slash subsidiaries and not just one that made the error. So if you look at the annual revenues for companies like Apple, Amazon, Airbnb, Uber, and many others, the fines could be well over $1 billion. And we kind of anticipate that after it comes into force, somebody is going to be uh, the victim of one of those large fines, I'm guessing, soon into the process, just to make a point. So why is this information, uh, so why is this important, I should say, since we live in Canada? So I would suggest to all of you that the Canadian privacy legislation does need a revamp, since it's quite old now, and we in Canada always like to have like legislation to the EU. None of us uh, like to reinvent the wheel, and neither does the federal government of Canada. So it, I can easily see after an appropriate waiting period to see how this all rolls out, some similar legislation here. Denise, can we do our, our second poll of the day, please? Sure. And that is, who is your privacy officer? Okay, the poll is open. And it looks like we have uh, an answer to the question, who is your privacy officer? 90% have said we have a privacy officer and 10% say they are not sure. Okay. Well, that's, that's a high number. 
So uh, very interesting. Thank you all for taking part in our polls. I'm going to go right over into the next slide. Now, I've tried to create a, uh, a slide here and take uh, everything into consideration of the different disciplines that we're doing presentations on. So I apologize to everybody for the size of this diagram. Uh, as you can see, uh, many of the tasks right in the center of all of those disciplines, they're, the tasks are right in the center. So senior management support is one of the first things on the list. It's kind of a universal. And uh, all of these things are listed in every, uh, every discipline and every requirement in every discipline. Senior management support comes in top of the list. So it's kind of a center of all of the disciplines. We need senior management support for this whole kind of information governance. What, why just do it for one? Why not for all that senior management support for that information governance overarching kind of discipline? And as you can see, uh, board governance is also changing. Uh, uh, I, I don't know how many of you follow the board governance uh, side of things, but uh, Current models of board governance suggest that board compositions also have expertise grounded in, they also need to have expertise grounded in security and IT as well. And I would go so far as to say that the board composition should include an information governance professional who can actually bring expertise to bear in all of those disciplines or an idea of how the moving parts fit together on all of those disciplines. Uh, risk management has become a pri primary responsibility of senior management more so in recent times as digital transformation occurs and security breaches happen on a regular basis. All of these disciplines call for appropriate policies, procedures, and training. As each presentation progresses, we'll all see that this, more of the similarities in the requirements. So from here, our next uh, presentation is actually uh, in the 101 series will actually be legal. So the next one will be legal 101. I haven't got a time on that yet, uh, timeline on that yet, but we'll definitely be going into that. Just as a hint up front, uh, that presentation will be looking at a, a general count from a general counsel view legal as opposed to a law firm style legal. So quite a different uh, vision of, of legal as, an, as a, uh, a discipline. And I thank you all very much for uh, being on the presentation today. I hope that you've found some interesting things. Uh, please pull down a few of those documents and have a read if you're so uh, disposed. And we have uh, a couple of minutes left if there's any questions. Uh, there's a mechanism to put questions in. But if not, I'll just say I, I miss seeing you all uh, in Saskatchewan, and uh, hopefully I will see you all in, the new, in this new year. Well, thanks again, Rick, for your presentation. Um, I don't see any questions at the moment. Certainly, feel free to contact Rick. Uh, you know, sometime uh, after this uh, presentation closes, if you feel like you want to ask a question that you didn't um, feel you could ask here. Um, now, uh, to reiterate um, uh, Rick's point, I appreciate the fact that you've shown some interest with this presentation, and we do hope to see you again in the sixth uh, or the fifth. I think the 101 presentation on legal and we do hope to have some follow-up 102 sessions for each one of these particular disciplines so we hope uh, that you'll keep an eye on that and we'll post those as soon as we have those arranged and scheduled and, and we look forward to seeing you here again so uh, without any um, further discussion because uh, my stomach's growling I don't know about the rest of you so uh, we look forward to hearing seeing you all again in our next presentation hopefully in a few weeks time. Thanks again.